live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering DockerCon 18. Brought to you by Docker and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE's continuing coverage of DockerCon 2018. I'm Lisa Martin with John Troyer. We are in San Francisco on this spectacularly sunny day. We're excited to welcome to theCUBE some guys from Red Hat. We've got Ben Briard, Senior Technical Product Manager, and Reza Shafi, VP of Platform Services. Guys, thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks for having us. Thank That's you. Great. So, Reza, you come from the CoreOS acquisition, you've been with Red Hat for technically about five months, Ben, you've been there about eight years, but I did see online that it's Red Hat's 25th anniversary. You guys have been doing something right for 25 years. <laughs> Open source, that's what we do. <laughs> Open source. So talk to us, what's going on at Red Hat, what's new, what's exciting? I mean, OpenShift is, I mean, that's, that's the big thing, right? I mean, so just, this is an, humbling time to be in the industry like with this container wave and to see the industry adoption that we've had with OpenShift and like how all the technology in Red Hat's portfolio is just pushing and driving that along. It's, it's, it's I don't know, yeah. it's exciting to me. No, it's very exciting. For us, I think the cultural compatibility between CoreOS and Red Hat has been just fabulous to see. And then seeing how Red Hat provides a platform to really uh, extend that and enhance that, it's, it's great. Yeah. Culture is key. We talk about culture a lot when, you know, at every event we talk about digital transformation, right? Yeah. Um, and culture is key to that. So maybe, Reza, give us a little bit of perspective. It's been five months now. How has CoreOS been embraced by the Red Hat guys, and how are you now living in harmony? Right. Well, first of all, you know, CoreOS, at, we always believed in open source. We were behind many open source projects in the containerized infrastructure space. And in that space, especially around Kubernetes, we worked very closely with Red Hat. So we knew each other really well. So as the, as the teams got together, it was very easy for us to really get together and brainstorm towards what are the possibilities. And that's what we've been working on. And we, the, actual, you know, the shovel has been hitting, hitting the ground for a while now, and we're working on a converged platform with, that brings Tectonics technology to OpenShift. That's been very exciting, as well as bringing the container Linux technology uh, together with Red Hat, so. Yeah. Uh, some of those announcements uh, happened at Red Hat Summit uh, a few weeks back or a month or so back. Can you talk about, have there been any other updates? Um, and also like, okay, we, and maybe go one level deeper. So Tectonic was CoreOS's, Kubernetes, uh, I don't, don't want to call it, would you call it a distribution? Uh, but a lot of uh, autonomic and uh, 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 automation technologies uh, for the operator built into Tectonic, which was part of CoreOS's core DNA now being brought into kind of the Red Hat platform. So maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, some, so that and some of the recent developments. Yeah, so where we're at, it's, it's kind of a, a phased implementation of bringing those technologies in, right? And so uh, our next quarterly release, right, is going to start, that's where you know, we start bringing in some of the components, right? And then the one after that, uh, you know, it's, it's more on the operator side, and then you know, the end of the year is when it's fully converged, and so that's, that's the path we're on. Yeah. In terms of uh, Kubernetes in general, Red Hat made a really early bet on Kubernetes uh, and a big shift, a big pivot uh, for its OpenShift platform, kind of really embracing, uh, throwing out a lot of the internals and embracing Kubernetes. Here at DockerCon, Kubernetes is, was a big topic. Uh, Docker's doing a lot of integration with Kubernetes. Uh, I kind of think that, that maybe that uh, is, uh, one size doesn't fit all, but certainly uh, Kubernetes is, is becoming uh, uh, accepted a, a lot more places. Uh, can you talk a little bit about you know, the implications of that, uh, that, that uh, th this phenomenon? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I think it's, there's a recognition that Kubernetes is not the de facto standard for orchestration. Right. I think even if you go back a year ago, that was probably not quite there, but now I think that, that sense is there. And I think you're right, like Red Hat embraced that three, four years ago, and so did CoreOS, and we both had to do a big shift, right? Uh, CoreOS was using fleets before that, and we made a sh shift to, uh, to Kubernetes. That has paid dividends, I think, because now we're really focusing on many of the concerns above and beyond just operating Kubernetes itself. It's what do you do above the stack and how do you operate everything above the stack? And that's where all the operator framework and everything we've been working on comes in. Yeah, I mean, it, it's basically how, how you get value in a more 
uh, apply the technology in a more application-centric way. And so it's just been great to see uh, the whole industry really rally around those standards and the APIs and everything, and you know all the cloud platforms, everything. And so it's it's yeah, it's where the ecosystem is. Let's talk about collaboration. When you're talking with customers, you know we we've talked a lot today and. And other, other events too, like all right, enterprises are spending a lot of money, a lot of their IT budgets on just keeping the lights on, on mission critical applications that they have to have, but there's very little budget for innovation, which is key to an organization being competitive, being relevant, and being a leader. What are some of the customer conversations that you guys are having, uh, and, and what are some of the common barriers to container adoption that you're helping with OpenShift, helping customers to eliminate? Yeah. I, I can take a shot at it. Uh, so essentially, now on Kubernetes, running stateless workload on Kubernetes is something that most people can do, right? Once you get to stateful workload, that starts getting tricky. And what we're seeing is the people who have now adopted Kubernetes for a year plus, they're starting to think, how do I run my stateful work on the databases, backend stores, in a, in a you know, scalable fashion on top of Kubernetes. And that's where we're coming in and trying to help people, help the community deliver that, really, um, through creation of operators, through creation of reusable business logic that can do that across any Kubernetes environment. Yep, well I was just going to add on to that. It's like, like as far as just keeping the lights on and freeing up resources, right? When you look at all of the, the path and the deployment models on the net and new stuff, right? We're able to take away a serious amount of like operational overhead and just everything to where people can scale and just move way faster, right? And so there's a certain amount of that value that carries over to the traditional stuff, right? And so, um, it, you know, it, I think the biggest thing for, on the customer side is just um, like a mindset and culture change and getting getting people to like, change the way they look at the problem, right? And, and so, the, you know, those things and just understanding security, th those are the big, the big topics. Nice, I, I was at uh, Summit, Red Hat Summit, uh, and one of the things that really impressed me there was the, this promise that, 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 you know, we've all been, been trying to uh, promise the end customer of time to value, that you can actually do things faster, that you, can in, you actually can innovate was actually starting to be real, in the sense that the, all the, the customer examples were in terms of weeks or months, and not years, and, and the app was up, and the app was multi-cloud, and, and all this other, and, and uh, so if you can talk a little bit about um, maybe some customers that, that, that are doing that, or some examples of that, of, of both time to value, and then the fact that a very few number of people were controlling very large infrastructures, and I think you were just touching on that in terms of the, oper the operators and, and just all the automation, the day two sort of things, uh, it seems like, I kind of think we've turned a corner in terms of uh, productivity and, and time to value and real life, real production workloads. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And when you look at like the like where we see adoption, be it the financial sector or I mean, it's all over the place. Uh, it's it's really encouraging. And so at, at Summit, we had I don't know I think like 300 or 200 customer talks. It was it was insane uh, about going through like the use cases and everything. Uh, you know some of the big ones is we're seeing from like Amadeus, Optum, and I mean, it, like, it was I it was great. I saw an IDC report I think on the Red Hat website that showed that customers that uh, adopt OpenShift can see a massive ROI. I want to say it was like over 500 percent ROI within a five year period. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I think part of there's there's multiple factors to that, right? Part of it comes out of just the sheer power of containerized infrastructure. Instead of deploying applications on a per compute basis and having to map them to single compute nodes, you have the orchestrator that plays that perfect Tetris game with all of your applications. Um, the other part comes a bit out of simplified operations, right? And that's where I think we're just the beginning of the, of the road. There is plenty more work to do on simplifying operations of Kubernetes, uh, and that's where I'm, I'm most excited about, honestly. Nice, I mean, let's talk about the future. We are, I don't know, at, at an inflection point of this container technology. Uh, it's, uh, it's becoming more mature, people are in production. Um, Multi-cloud is, is a certainly an aspect of what's going on but I'd love for you to kind of explore a little bit more about um, some of the tooling. Like, I don't know if we need to get down into the OCI and the runtime level, but uh, you know, what do we see the tooling doing? So, okay, Kubernetes is there, uh, uh, 
you know, that level is, is there, but like, what about the, you know, Builda and other things like that? Like, what other pieces of tooling and automation are being developed uh, to help, again, help developer productivity? Yeah, that's a good one. So I'll take a shot and then we'll, so it's a couple things. So Kubernetes itself is pluggable on like every tier, right? So it's, it's finding that balance of, of like, sane defaults and like guidance of you know what works, but then being flexible to work in customer environments so we can lock into whatever kind of build strategy pipelines and you know whatever works for the customer uh, and they're frankly different teams, right? Because they you know, they all have different levels of maturity and stuff. So uh, so that's one thing is just that providing that level of flexibility. And the other thing is is you know like you said multi cloud, uh, just the way OpenShift provides that like common platform across everything, right? It just abstracts away any of the you know, differences and what, whatever. Yeah, and we're seeing multi-cloud more and more with our customer yeah. base, and having a consistent model to deal with every one of them, including their on-prem environment, is becoming a bigger deal. Hmm. The, um, in terms of, uh, so on-prem, maybe, let, actually I think it'd be useful, we've been talking about Kubernetes and OpenShift a lot, but maybe let's, let's step up a level and, and say, okay, OpenShift, how do you decide, so OpenShift has Kubernetes in it, but it's much more, it's a, it's a services platform uh, built up off of uh, you know, RHEL on the bottom all the way up to kind of operators now. Can you talk a little bit about what else, is, what is some of the special sauce of OpenShift? Yeah, uh, so kind of what I was saying earlier about just like kind of every layer. So we start, you know, like you said, RHEL, right? So the supported bulletproof kernel, right? Up to the runtime, to the, the you know, the, like literally the enterprise Kube distribution is OpenShift. And then what we bring to it is this like amazing developer experience, right? And, and like the secret sauce of where it's going is all of the beauty from the CoreOS side on top of that. So like we've had the developer story, right? So like really prescriptive onboarding of applications is, is like the power because an empty cluster is useless, right? So you've got to have that, that like easy path to onboard. And then uh, when we marry that with the day two stuff and all of the, you know, the deployments, the operators, everything. I mean, that's the, that, those pieces coming together is like what's, what differentiates it. Right, from just a bare kind of Kubernetes, because right. it gets you part of the way, but there's certainly a lot yeah, more. Yeah, it doesn't have any of, the, any of the developer experience, right. the web console, the, the admin console, like none of that stuff exists, right? Yeah, the way I, I look at it is that the, the value add comes from two perspectives, right? One is from the system administrators and the infrastructure owners. The, that certainly comes to day two operations and how much to simplify that. How do you get a consistent interface across different environments? And how do you do things like accountability? Um, converging everything onto the same cluster, which is really what Kubernetes does, also changes the focus from a cost perspective, for example, from different application owners to a single owner. How do you make sure that like, that owner is able to say, well, these are the people who are using it and this is how much, we have services on top of uh, Kubernetes in OpenShift that provide you that capability, for example, through metering and chargeback. Sometimes people call it metering and shameback. Um, <laughs> and then from the point of view of developers, you know, there is multiple opinionated ways of simplifying developers' life. Right? And any given large enterprise has many, many ways of doing that. And we want to just be ready to address all of them. And by the way, we have our own opinions right. and we have built that on top of OpenShift as well. So you guys work a lot with developers. We have about five or 6,000 people that are here at this event. I'm curious, when you go to open source events, including your own, are you finding that same mix of developers, IT professionals, enterprise architects, and execs? And if so, are, what is that conversation like at that higher level where there might be you know, checkbooks and keys of the kingdom and a, and a business saying, hey, we have to uh, iterate quickly. What, what is kind of the mix of conversations that you guys find in these communities? Yeah, it's the difference between strategy, right, and versus like bits, right? So the admin, developer, we want to focus, we want to get into the weeds, right? And then the higher levels, it's all about strategy, direction, and enablement, and those types of you know higher level concepts, right? So, I mean, that's that's I don't know my perspective. Are you finding that the, the your conversations and maybe education of developers helps them then go up the chain within their organizations to explain this is why we need to do this? Yeah, I, I think there's some of that, right? Uh, the, the other thing I, I left off the list though is the cultural piece because uh, traditional enterprises they 
there's something here that they want to gleam and take home and in the culture space, right? And so that's a, you know, that's, that's the other big one, I don't know. Uh, I, I find that the conversation varies widely, right? So when you talk to the infrastructure administrators and developers, you got to be able to talk very technical and explain to them exactly how all this is working. And they're interested in the future and technology. But when you talk to the CIOs out there and uh, the CTOs out there, really they're interested in the outcome. And when you talk about the outcome, it's easy just to show, like look, everybody wants to get to a pure DevOps model. Everybody wants to get to a microservices model. Um, this is kind of like going to the gym and seeing the picture of the really fit people and then uh -huh. saying, well, yeah, but how do I get there, right? Um, and this is where I think a company like Red Hat can come in and say, well, we will work with you to get you there, right? So that's, that's important. Well, and the other one is just the value of being there and talking to your peers in the industry too, right? I mean, yeah, it's us, we're facilitating, but it's, it's, it's peers too, right? So. But you're right, culture, we've talked about that, John, a number of times today, how critical culture is to being able to move past inertia. I'm, you know, we mentioned when I kick off the segment that Red Hat is just celebrating its 25th birthday. So I imagine, I know you've been there, Ben, for eight years, that there's been a lot of change there and a lot of cultural kind of mindset shift. Obviously, Reza coming on the last five months. Give us a little bit of an insight into the, the Red Hat culture that's helping to drive the, the agility that you need to also give your customers. Yeah. Um, this is something our CEO talks about all the time, right? He wrote a book on it, The Open Organization, and you know, just like lays out like clear values of, of like transparency, like doing things and like like very visually. Like we, we go through these exercises all the time, just for like changing our slogans and brands and these types of things in the way that where everybody participates and everybody takes like ownership in it, right? And is part of it. And so that's it's one thing. I mean, we've been going through crazy growth. When I joined, it was like 3,000 people. Now it's like 12,000 or so. I don't, I don't know the exact number, but uh, and so how we scale that culture has been it's been interesting, but it's 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 been really successful. I mean, that's a, that's a big part of it. Open was a really clear message from Summit. Uh, you know, and basically in, in the cloud, Open has won, right? O open innovation, oh, yep. open source, open culture. Uh, that's what's driving all the things we see now. I'd say, yes. Well guys, thanks so much, Ben and Reza, for stopping by theCUBE and sharing with us what's new at Red Hat, what excites you guys, and we look forward to having you back on. Thanks thank so much you. for having us. We want to thank you guys for watching theCUBE. Lisa Martin with John Troyer from DuckerCon 2018. Stick around, we'll be right back with our next guest. <laughs>